All right. Okay. All right, there we go. Here we go. Welcome everybody. Welcome, wow. welcome, welcome. Hey, all these familiar faces, turn on your cameras. Hey, Ariel, with the big bright painting behind you, looking great. Hey, yeah. Peter. Hey, Will and Kim and Susan, welcome everybody. So happy to have you here. Feel free to take a seat, turn on your camera if you want to. This is gonna be a fireside chat with conversation. My name's Carrie Henley. I am here to kick us off from the Modern Elder Academy and bring up Chip in a moment and the infamous Ken Dykewald. You're in for a great conversation today. I've been looking forward to this all week. And um, so how many of you are here for the very first time to any sort of an MEA fireside chat event? Wave at me. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How many of you are MEA alumni? Wave at me, MEA alumni. Hi. Hi, welcome everybody. Wonderful. So let's just do a quick spin around the Zoom, the Zoom world. You can put it in the gap. Richard Leiter's here. Hey, Richard, great to see you. We've got an all-star cast here. Everybody go ahead and check out the chat box and feel free to pop in there where you are in the world right now. It's amazing. We tend to have folks from all over the world who join us for these fireside chats. Our alumni currently boast from over 40 countries. And I just find that I never get tired of that. I just find it so inspiring to- Senpei's here, Senpei's here Senpei is Japan. here, one of our illustrious alumni from Japan who gets up in the middle of the night to join us live. <laughs> Senpei, it's great to have you. So enjoy With that Pol chat Poland. waterfall. New Zealand is here, Poland, wow. New Zealand, Austria. Um, I think we saw Ukraine. Uh, yes. Canada, all over, and I oh guess I am gosh, now on camera. Oh my gosh, this is so camera. exciting! So you can use that chat box to post a question. If you have a, if you're having a, a Zoom issue or anything, you can send a private chat to me. I'll be happy to do uh, what I can to help you. Uh, Chip and Ken are going to chat for about twenty or thirty minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions. Where you'll have a chance to either raise your hand and come on stage with us, or uh, pop your question into the chat. Either one is fine. And we're just delighted to have you. So I'm not going to take any more time. Let me introduce Chip Conley, founder of M uh, Modern Elder Academy and our host of these amazing fireside chats. Thank you for being here today, Thanks. Chip. Thank you, Carrie Henley. Um, Carrie Henley Carnale. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, be the officiant at her wedding in August, and she met her husband to be here at MEA in oh. June of 2018. So um, Ken Dykewald, man, you are, you're, you're, you're my older brother. Um, <laughs> and you have, you, there's so many things that I can say about you that I will just sprinkle them throughout our time together. But let me start by saying to the group that I've known Ken for, for a number of years, partly because of our mutual uh, association with the Esalen Institute and Big Sur, but also over time, so many mutual friends. Then who knew I would be interested in the topic that Ken got interested in, in his early 20s, which we'll talk about soon. But let me just first say, Ken, it's sort of remarkable in, a, in an unfortunate way that it has taken me five years to get you, to, to, to have you join us in the MEA community for a conversation like this. So we're very honored to have you. I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this. I uh, was in New York yesterday. I flew home late last night and I got up early this morning and was thinking, hey, I'm going to get to talk to my buddy Chip Conley today. So uh, I hope you ask me some edgy questions and make me talk about naked people at Esalen, at least for a moment. Well, let's start with that. Okay. <laughs> you are the pinata, my friend. Um, so let's start. I, I, you know, sorry about the garbled. I, I'm taking off the AirPods and just going au, nat au natural in terms of my, my audio. Um, and by the way, I have a little bit of laryngitis uh, having taught. This is my third week in a row here down in Baja. Um, and so let's start with what is a what's a good boy from Jersey doing in a place like this? Um, what, what brought you from New Jersey to the West coast and, uh, 
how were you introduced to the human potential movement at Esalen? Well, um, so my brother's on the call. Hey, Al. Um, we grew up in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, our neighborhood was sort of lower to middle class, a lot of aspiration, uh, a lot of people hoping to get out or make something of themselves. I believed I was going to become a physicist and went to college to work my way towards that goal and with the hope that I would probably wind up living somewhere in New Jersey. Um, but then in my junior year, Chip, I had to take a, a, a humanities type course and I wandered into a class called the psychology of human potential. And uh, I had never been to a psychologist. I didn't know what psychology was. The professor was this hip young guy that had just, even though this is Bethlehem, Pennsylvania at Lehigh, he just got his doctorate at Stanford. So he was kind of tuned into Mary Pranksters and Stuart Brand and Whole Earth Catalog and all kinds of cool things. The very first textbook I ever used in psychology was called The Varieties of the Psychedelic Experience. <laughs> My master's in Houston and I thought, wow, what is this psychology stuff? And then we read A. Maslow's Toward a Psychology of Being, which of course you've written your own book on. And then we did uh, Alan Watts's Psychotherapy East and West, and then Will Schutz's book Joy about encounter groups. And um, one of the things that struck me uh, was this idea that it had never crossed my mind. And it was the idea that as humans, we had these extraordinary potentialities for art, for music, for thinking, for emotional intelligence. Danny Goldman hadn't popularized that phrase yet, but for you know empathy, for creativity, for kindness, for physical power. And we were only using five or 6% of that. And I thought that's about the wildest idea I ever heard, like what's up with us. And what I learned in this course was that there were techniques and technologies, some from the, from the East, yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, and some from the West that were emerging, gestalt, biofeedback, um, you know, you name it, encounter groups. And, but at the end of all these books, Chip, and again, I'm a sort of a run of the mill, pretty well plain vanilla kid. And, but at the end of all these books, it said so-and-so, so-and-so, Alan Watts is a teacher at the Esalen Institute. Now there was no Google at the time. Of course. So, you know, how, so what's Essel Institute? But Will Schutz left Harvard to be a resident at Essel Institute and John Lilly, Essel Institute and blah, blah, blah. And so what struck me was that there was something going on having to do with trying to figure out how to guide and help people through not only transitions, but transformations. And so it, to the dismay of my family, I quit college and moved from uh, essentially from Newark to Big Sur. But here's where my stupidity becomes perhaps most obvious. I didn't wait, really- Wait, 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 let's just like one second. <laughs> Newark, how many people moved from Newark to Big Sur? I mean, I, I don't know if it's happened before or since. No one else I know. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not, you know, and I would have to tell you that Newark and Big Sur have nothing in common. Um, so, I didn't know, this is my stupidity, or I should say ignorance, it wasn't stupidity. I didn't know you're supposed to take a workshop, let's say like an MEA workshop, and then digest it for a while. I thought you take like a semester. So I sold everything I owned, I even cut into my bar mitzvah money, and I signed up for five months worth of workshops at Esalen. <laughs> Nude encounter groups, sensitivity training, tantric yoga, um, dream analysis. By the way, you get in a room with a group of strangers and everybody's spilling their dreams. Uh, that'll take you to a different place. And week after week, Friday to Sunday, Sunday to Friday, I found myself, I felt like I was sort of in the modern version of Shaolin. I was training myself to be a different kind of human. And it became sort of a love affair for me. I will say, just to add one more piece to the puzzle, I was particularly captivated by the ways in which our emotions become embodied, what I refer to as body mind. And I actually wrote my first book, Body Mind, when I was 22. Um, happy to say it's still in print in about a dozen languages. Um, but the key point was, and I guess it was the first time that I poked, poked the bear, 
I thought we got the field of psychology that pays very little attention to the body. And we got the field of allopathic medicine, which seems to have very little regard for the mind. What's up with that? Um, we need to start thinking more holistically. And by the way, that happens to be a word. I know nobody in this call is going to believe this, but when I left Esalen and joined with Gay Luce to create an academy of human potential, Stuart Brand, this was 1974 uh, when I left Esalen. I spent 70 to 74 there um, studying and then teaching and writing. Stuart Brand took an interest in what we were doing in Berkeley, California, he gave us $5,000 and said, you guys need to you know, file as a not for profit. And we had to make up a name. So what do we call ourselves? You know, I'm sure you went through this with Modern Elder Academy. Do we call ourselves the Human Potential University? We... And Gay and I made up the phrase holistic health. But she, who had been a science writer, was now on the board of the Tibetan Institute in Berkeley and wanted it spelled H-O-L, like holy. I thought it should be spelled W-H-O-L. She was smarter and more influential than I was at the time, so she won out. And I got to watch the whole holistic health field kind of grow out of our meeting room over the coming years. So, so what got me from Newark to Big Sur was this fascination with could we be more than we were? And where do you want to go from here? Well, uh, so I, I would just say that maybe um, you're a bit of a pioneer. Um, Esalen has you know gone mainstream many, many years later. Um, but then you, what I think is most curious, and we're going to talk about radical curiosity in a few minutes, your, your newest book. But one of the things I think is so curious is that in your early to mid 20s, you started to show an interest in older people. Um, now, I don't know a lot of people who in their early to mid 20s actually get to the point of saying, I'm going to create a career focused on older people. What? So you're a pioneer again. What led you in your mid 20s? to actually start to study gerontology and then ultimately create, create age wave. Well, I could tell you like a, you know, a Tony Robbins BS story, or I could tell you the truth. Which would you rather? Truth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I was living in Big Sur. Uh, I had hair down to my waist. I had earrings and yoga pants and, um, you know, saw myself as Mr. Body Mind, and I thought, I'm going to be here forever. You know, I got a path, I got a plan, I'm on it. Um, and I rented a little cabin for $150 a month. Uh, if any of you ever been a Big Sur, it was across the river from the River Inn. And one morning at 5.30 in the morning, uh, somebody comes knocking, banging on my door. And I show up in my front door, and I said, who are you? He says, no, who are you? And I said, well, I live here. He says, well, I own this place. My name's Jan Brewer. And I said, well, I thought you lived in New Zealand. He says, yeah, but I'm back and I want you out. And I said, no, I got a lease. And he reaches into his vest and he pulls out a gun. No, no, no making this up. Puts it to my head. He says, no, I want you out now. In fact, I'd like you out of Big Sur. By the way, Jan ultimately uh, died in jail. Um, but so I got sort of thrown off my game plan by a crazy man. Um, but I was dear friends with Jean Houston, and she matched me up with Gay Luce, who had just moved to Berkeley. Gay was a, also a doctoral. We were both completing our doctorates together. And Gay got this idea, as I mentioned, for a Human Potential Academy and what I helped craft the program. So it was, this is before Dean Ornish and before Andy Weil. Could we somehow marry together yoga, tai chi, biofeedback, journal writing, encounter, gestalt, group discussion, homework assignments, uh, mindfulness practice. And I, sh I said, sure, I'd love to create that with you. I was 20, just turned 24. But then, so I left Big Sur, I was living in my van, and I got a little apartment in Berkeley behind a Chinese restaurant. And Gay's mom had hypertension problems. And she tried deep breathing and meditation and bio feedback on her, and she got better. So Gay at the last minute said, let's do this year long curriculum, but only with older people. And I thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? 
why would I want to do that? You know? And by the way, how, let, how let me, old were you, Ken? How old I just, were you? I had just turned 24. Okay, got it. I want to point out that when I was living in Big Sur, it was a hangout scene. So I spent a lot of time with Tim Leary and Ram Dass and John Lilly and all kinds of guru y types. But I said, look, I'm not sure that I'm I had a great relationship with our grandparents. They were wonderful people. We lived in the same home with them when we were little. Um, I said, I'll do this for a few months, but then I'm going to move on. But then I found myself really being enchanted by these elders, uh, not so much because of how sharply they dressed or because of their guru-ness, but because of their perspective, Chip. I mean, when you talk to an 80 or 90 year old, one of my first assignments was I asked everybody to take a piece of graph paper and map their life, chart it, and they could. And they would explain, I had those 12 years that were terrible because I lost somebody I loved, but then I made some new friends or then I got a better job or then I found myself and I soared for 20 years. And I began thinking, wow, forget all the gurus. Here we got all these older people with essentially all the answers, but nobody's bothering to ask them the questions. And so I really became captivated by elders and also aging. The project, which we ultimately named the SAGE Project, a division of the Holistic Health Council, became wildly successful. And Gay, to my advantage, didn't particularly like to speak in public. So she was getting invitations to speak in London and Berlin and Copenhagen and New York and Chicago. And she'd say to me, why don't you do them? You do these talks. And so before you knew it, here I was flying around the world talking about a new image of aging, and I was 24 and became friends with Bob Butler, who became my mentor from the National Institutes on Aging. And my best, one of my best friends at the time became Maggie Kuhn, who had just started the Grey Panthers. And they kind of encouraged me. They said, you know, when an older person talks about older people, people put it in a certain box. But to have a young kind of snarky guy like you talking about what an ageist culture we have, and why we ought to contemplate the idea of longevity as, as an advantage and fix some of the problems along the way, that could make an impact. So I got in it, I got in it young. I will say one other thing that happened. When I was 32, we used to have a thing called the Office of Technology Assessment. It was a nonpartisan division of the Congress. And there was a two year study project focused on how America was going to be transformed by the aging of our population, particularly declining fertility rates, increasing longevity, and the aging of the massive boomer generation. And I spent two years as kind of the runt of the litter on that, uh, on that task force. And what struck me was that we're not just dealing with elders, but there's also aging, which is really all about the whole process of life and all its transitions. But we're also dealing with demography that we've built our world to match the form and fit of who we've always been. And you know this, Chip, but throughout 99% of human history, the average life expectancy was under 18. Mm -hmm. And so there have always been some 50 and 70 and 90 year olds, but not a lot. Right. But what was going to be happening in the 21st century, where we are now, was there was going to be a kind of a flipping of the seesaw so that more and more media, marketing, attention, business, products, government programs, programs like the extraordinary stuff you've been doing are going to rise up. So I started writing book after book after book after book. I've written, you mentioned 18, I've actually done another one since then. I, I, and, and the big one I wrote was Age Wave, which came out, I started when I was 30, it came out when I was 39, trying to envision what are the opportunities and what are the challenges that we'll face personally and also culturally and globally. By the way, along the way, I did get my doctorate on the psychology of the body. Mm. So, so, so Ken, uh, you started studying aging 50 years ago. Yes, 48. Ago. So how, have the, how would you see the world has changed with respect to aging longevity and then also retirement? <clears throat> because your last book was what, what do retirees want? Is that is that what it's called? What retirees what, want? A whole list of you of life at age. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So tell us a little bit more about what's changed in the last 50 years. 
Let me back it up just a little bit. I think I'll, I'll, I, I, I'm going to make this up right now. I think let's think in terms of three eras. The pre-industrial era, elders were treasured. If you think of the signing of our Constitution, people wore white wigs to look older. Even in Great Britain, the barristers still wear powder their hair, white wigs, because older people were believed to have wisdom, uh, was believed before there was a germ theory of disease that God selected those who he or she chose to live longer. And also they owned everything because we were agrarian. So if you wanted a piece of the land, you better make sure grandma and grandpa thought well of you. Then the industrial era came along. And all of a sudden it wasn't agricultural wisdom that got anybody anywhere. It was a strong back and a willingness to move to the cities and work in the factories and work in the, the, the rising America, the roaring 20s. And then we doubled down after World War II and all the baby boomers came along, 76 million of us. When that happened, kind of a, a really crummy thing went down, which is we started arguing that young is good, old is not so good. Young is beautiful, old is kind of ugly. Uh, young is the future, old is the past. Young is who we want to be, old is who we have to apologize if that's what we are. And we lived through much of the 20th century with kind of that dark picture. And you asked about retirement. I'll point out something that many people don't pay, I think, enough attention to. Retirement was a brilliant idea in the 1930s. But the primary driver of it was, on the one hand, the high level of poverty among old people. A third of all elders in America were impoverished. So $120 a year, which was the Social Security payout, $10 a month, was seen to be perhaps a safety net. But just as important, the unemployment level reached 25%. So Roosevelt was quite brilliant. He said, if we can move the old people out of the workforce, we'll make room for the young people, and we got a future to our nation. So we had a century where increasingly youth became kind of glorified and maturity became disenfranchised. You know, Mark Friedman, our friend, refers to it as age apartheid. Um, older people became less. But now I think we're in a new era. I think we're attempting to, you took note when John Glenn went up into space at 77 and he told the reporters, just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. And a lot of us who have degrees in psychology said, wait a minute, we thought only young people had dreams. That's all Freud really, Freud talked about. He didn't talk about 70 year olds reinventing themselves. You know, Jung mentioned it a little bit, but most of psychotherapy was focused on youth. Even Eric Erickson, one of my mentors, had eight stages of life, but the first five of them were youth, you know? So, but what's beginning to happen is Don Glenn, Betty White last year got everybody's attention because here's somebody at 99 who's beautiful and not trying to be young and funny and charismatic. And people said, wow, I didn't know you could be 99 like that. And so more and more people are staying at work longer. And some people are beginning to reinvent themselves and try new things, maybe write their first book of poems when they're 70. My brother who's on the call after a 50 year break took up the drums again. And now his band did 91 gigs during the year before COVID. He realized he's a musician, but he just took a 50 year break doing, you know, home refinancing, which wasn't where his heart was. And so, by the way, I will tell you that one of the challenges to all this that I've noticed is that as we begin to see more mature people and we get rid of the word senior, which people don't like anymore, and we begin to even contemplate the idea of eldership, adult, middle essence, late adulthood, and then eldership, how do people learn who to be who they might be? You know, when my kids were contemplating what to do after high school, there were courses, workshops, visits to campuses, military meetings you could have, gap year discussions, websites. But you got, you know, 10,000 people a day, four million a year moving into this new stage of life, which might be 20 or 30 years now with no orientation program at all, other than what you're trying to do, frankly. Well, let's be clear. So the Four million a year are the number of people turning sixty-five every year. Correct, and 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 hitting retirement age. So what what you, you wrote a book? What retirees want is what retirees want today different than what they wanted thirty or forty years ago. 
Very much so. 30 or 40 years ago, and I was in the field then, so I'm not making this up from somebody else's work. A lot of what retirees wanted was a, a chance to take a break, a rest, the, the possibility after a life of hard work, more of the work was physical labor than today. It's more white collar, but they wanted a chance to socialize, to maybe take a vacation or two that they had been dreaming of in this, I hate this phrase, bucket list. Um, spend time with their family and hopefully not suffer much before their end came, before the batteries wore out. Today, people are dreaming of becoming entrepreneurs. The highest rate of entrepreneurial success in America in the last decade has been people over 50 who are pursuing it as their after retirement career because they've got some smarts and they know how things work, like what you did with the Airbnb guys. What else do people want? They want what's valuable in life. And when you're 30, you think you know, but when you're 70, you know a little better. And it's usually the people you love and the people who love you back. So people decide they want to have better relationships. Also, I think that there's more worry today about money because in for a previous generation, we had a three-legged stool where uh, guaranteed benefits and a better ratio supported things like social security ratio of young relative to old. Um, and today, some people are a little bit anxious. Maybe I won't be able to retire at 65. And, and guess what? 65 was chosen in the 1880s by Baron Otto von Bismarck to be the time at which folks should retire. But the life expectancy in Europe and the Americas then, Chip, as you know, was only 45. So it's a little bit ridiculous that if we're going to live 80 or 90 or 100 years, that we stop working at 64 or 65. And unless you're, you know, Bill Gates, most people can't afford that. So there's more desire for reinvention. People are more interested in using their resilience and emotional intelligence to uh, improve their relationships with loved ones. A big appetite to go back to school and learn new things, which our parents' generation were not drawn to. And last, a kind of a wake-up call during COVID about the importance of uh, making some financial moves so that you don't have to go to sleep at night worried. Yeah. Do you... Um... Do you think that the actual word retirement will be retired? Uh, you know, is it, is it is it a word that's still, you know, obviously the American Association of Retired People, AARP, sort of hid the word in, in, in an acronym. Um, do you think that retirement as a word and even as the concept is about to have, you know, have it's lived past its useful life? I looked up the word retirement in Webster's Unabridged Dictionary a few years ago, and the definition of retirement is to disappear, to go away, to withdraw. So do I ever think that that was a good idea for people to spend a large portion of their life disappearing? Uh, I, I never. And I would tell you that in 2004, I'm not a very good writer, although I keep trying my best. Um, I did a piece with two partners for the Harvard Business Review, and we titled it, It's Time to Retire Retirement. That was 18 years ago. And just as kind of a, oh, I don't know, a Rod Serling Twilight Zone episode, we actually, I got a call at the end of the year, we'd won the McKinsey Prize. It was the best business article of the year. But mm -hmm. they said, you're going to have, but you're tied. There was another individual who also won the first place McKinsey Prize for his piece. So at the banquet, you're going to you're going to have to share the space with him. Yeah, you're on it. And I said, well, OK, who's that? And they said, Peter Drucker. And I said, what? And he was 95. And by the way, as a joke, sort of, when they did his bio, they only gave his biographical information for what he did since he had been 65. So I think that the word retirement should have been dropped a long time ago. And I've seen all the unretirement, free retirement, power years. I mean, everybody keeps trying to come up with a new phrase. But at the end of the day, I think that what you're going to see is sort of the dissolution of the cliff. You work, you stop. I think you're going to see people cycling in and out of work and some time for leisure for a break for some great holidays. 
I think you're also going to see people working pro bono. We used to call it volunteerism, but I think you're going to see more philanthropinerialism, where people will do cool things with their volunteering. They won't just work in the traditional things. They'll be mentors, or, or frankly, I wish I, I had a hand in the great word that you created, mentorn, because I think that's the game, that for old and young and younger generations to share and learn and teach and benefit each other makes us all uh, happier. I, I gave the keynote this week for an organization called SIFMA. It's the securities industry big convention. And so we had hundreds and hundreds, 450 people from all over the world that run all the big financial firms. And one of the slides that I showed was, is that if people don't volunteer in their maturity, there's a decent level of happiness and well-being and sense of purpose. But those who do contribute and volunteer, it almost doubles. So how fantastic that by helping other people in your maturity, when you have more time affluence, and by the way, the boomers in the United States alone are going to have two and a half trillion hours of free time over the next 20 years. Worldwide, it's 50 trillion hours. If more of us who are older leaned in and tried to do something good, I know you're, you know, all the three generations at dinner, but if it was more than that, if we all tried to come together and the elders shared more of themselves and their knowledge and their skills and their wisdom, I think the younger people would benefit and older people be feeling more purposeful too. So I think retirement, I, you know, I tried out different words. I'm not sure that there's another snappier word that's going to take its place, but I think the notion of you were working and now you're done forever and it's time to, you know, go to the sidelines. I think that's over. You know, there's a, we just put on the website, a workshop for in March that's going to come out in March called reframing retirement um, with Colleen Drummond, who is actually on this call. She just, yeah, she likes philanthropy. I just seeing that. And Donna and says, her, we don't have to name this, just call us by our own names. I'm not a retiree. Yeah. Let's call me she's Donna. A, she's a retired partner for KPMG, as well as Bob Laura, who is founder of Retirement Coaches Association. So um, for those, maybe K Carrie can put the link there. Oh, Carrie did. Carrie, you're so damn good. By the way, you, Carrie, Bob, I, I'm going to interrupt you. Bob yeah. Laura, who I don't didn't know was on the call, Retirement Coaches Association is a great idea because most people don't know. You could do this. You could do that. You could volunteer. You could go back to school. You could start your own business. And we don't really have a profession alive right now to help the hundred million people who are in that stage of life right now. So I think what Bob has done with his retirement coaches association is a great idea. Yeah, no, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a great week. And Je uh, Jeff Hemui, one of my co-founders and I are, are teaching it with them. So keep that one in mind. Now let's move uh, to radical curiosity, uh, which I thought was your last book, but it sounds like you popped out another book since we last talked. But Radical Curiosity is one of your last books, uh, and it's a memoir. It's a, it is a book dedicated to telling your story. Uh, and how, so what is Radical Curiosity? And what, if, what did you write in this book that you haven't said before? Well, first, let me say that all of my earnings in this book are being donated to Esalen. So it's a little bit of closing a, a circle there. And by the way, I just saw my cousin, Michael Klein, on the call. Hey, Mike, <laughs> say hi to your family. All right, so what was I thinking? Well, we were doing research at AgeWave, my company, on inheritance, uh, maybe a decade ago, Chip, and we found that nobody in the focus groups wanted to talk about inheritance. It felt creepy to them. It was about who's gonna get what piece of the house by the lake and who owns what. But I said to the focus group moderator, try a different word ask if anybody would like to leave a legacy or receive a legacy. And the conversation went wild. You know, you and I both have a, this love affair with words. If you can get the right word around something, it kind of changes the narrative and it changes mindset. And what we learned was, was that legacy was yes, real estate and, and, and money, but even more important to people were life lessons. I, and by the way, there are religious traditions that have what they call a material will, which is who's going to get what that you own of the material things. 
but even more important, the word is not great, but it was called an ethical will. The idea being that how are you going to make sure that what you've learned in this life, your knowledge, wisdom, your failures, your flops, your fall downs, your terrors, your bad dreams, your hopes, your great accomplishments, the lessons from those. We're supposed to be gathering lessons in this lifetime. But if you don't gather them, they're lost. So I decided after my dad passed away to put myself back in psychotherapy. Uh, we had kind of a rumbling relationship. My dad was a, a great guy, but he and I would butt heads quite a lot. I've met your dad. He, your dad would be a lot easier to get along with, I think, than my dad. Um, and I began to realize that I've, I've, you know, when you work with President Carter to help him craft his Virtues of Aging book, you learn some things. And when you spend Ronald Reagan's 79th birthday with him and he tells you what he thinks America is, you learn some things. And as a young man, I had a great dinner with Bucky Fuller when he challenged me to try to figure out my purpose in life. And I realized that I had all these experiences and stories at Esalen and aging and trying to make successful businesses, having some failures and that I was going to try to gather as stories, not only to have them for my children, and if they one day ever have children, they can say, who is that grandpa guy we've heard about? What was his life all about? But I felt the importance of gathering one's life lessons is something, now listen to what I say here, Chip, something I think we should all do. You don't have to be an author or famous or rich. You have learned, all of you on this call have learned things in your life that are precious and valuable. And so I just decided I was gonna to try to gather it together as a book and my public, I was gonna call it The Sorcerer's Apprentice. I've always been taken by this character who went a little crazy trying to do the magician's stuff in Fantasia. And my publisher, who was a brilliant guy said to me, no, we're gonna name it what your life is about. And I said, oh, what, you're going to tell me what my life is about? You've read my manuscript and you think you're my psychotherapist now? And he says, well, I'll try. I said, what's that? He said, you've been driven by curiosity. So we're going to name the book Radical Curiosity. And I thought, well, everybody's driven by curiosity. And he says, not everybody is. That a lot of the focus on uh, the success magazines is money and wealth and abundance and power. Maybe curiosity ought to have its place in our lives. And especially when you overlay it with the human potential, how are you going to learn to be more than you are if you're not curious enough to ask questions or to take classes or to be in the presence of others who could share with you? And <clears throat> one of the things I think happens when people grow older is they feel like maybe they're too old to be curious and you know what's all that stuff with billy eilish i don't care about that music or what's that going on with all these uh with sexual flu fluidity among the young generation uh, that's not my problem that i feel that curiosity ought to be lifted up and taught in the schools and ungoogleized because now most people think between google and its ownership of youtube that you don't really have to think through anything. You can just look up the answer. And I think probing, exploring, wanting to reach higher to know more are, are, are characteristics that would benefit more of us if we had more of it going on. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. In the early days when I was working on the book Wisdom at Work, uh, The Making of a Modern Elder, I talked with you about modern, the modern elder, and um, we talked about that phrase. And I, I mentioned to you that I was told by the founders of Airbnb that a modern elder is someone who's as curious as they are wise. And it's that perfect alchemy of knowing when, what is needed at this moment. Is curiosity needed or is wisdom? Because curiosity opens up possibilities and wisdom distills down what's essential. So that is really what you're saying, is that curiosity is probably, and I think Peter Drucker was one of the more curious people, and he lived till 95, and he wrote, you know, two-thirds of his 40 books uh, after the age of 65. So I, it seems like curiosity is the elixir of life. Yeah, you know, here's a really crazy thing. Um, 
it, when I bring up the word curiosity, there's a phrase that most people have in their mind that goes along with it. Curiosity killed the cat. Now, like, who? what's that supposed to be? We, we ought to be thinking curiosity will make you more open-minded. Curiosity might teach you something new. What was Einstein's phrase? You know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. You've got to be curious enough to explore. You know, the world is about exploration. And, um, you know, words are a funny thing. When you crafted Menturn, did anybody say to you, by the way, when I'm writing things or coming up with book ideas and I've made up elder care, healthy aging, age wave, body mind, I, I put a lot of words into the narrative. People will, and when it says this is not a word, you know, when your when your word <laughs> spelling comes up, I always think, good, you know, I'm onto something. When you crafted Menturn, did everybody immediately say no? Really? <laughs> Not. No, I mean, let's let's define it so everybody knows. A mentor is someone who's a mentor and an intern at the same time, which is someone who's as curious as they are wise. And so, yes, um, there are some business schools that now actually use the term, but I don't think it's actually gone mainstream by any stretch of the imagination. So, and you had a problem with your, you know, you sat here and right this same oh. room. We talked about your manuscript, and your publisher was worried about the word elder because it sounded like elderly. Yeah, no, they, they basically said, you want to, you, we want to publish your book. This is the number one the largest publisher in the world. We want to publish your book, but you can't call it modern elder. And, <laughs> and I was like, well, that's the point of the book. And they said, no. So we ultimately compromised and said wisdom at work, the making of a modern elder. Um, but then, you know, I, went, I doubled down on Modern Elder Academy, but uh, also known as MEA. Um, I, we need to wrap in a second to go to questions. But let me just say, I mean, you and I could talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, I think one of the things that is really interesting to me, uh, Ken, and, and for those who want to actually ask a question, this is the time to go down to the bottom of your menu under reactions and <laughs> do the raise it hand function. And the raise hand function will allow you to be at the front of the line. Do it now, because quite frankly, most people do it in the last five minutes, right? <laughs> right before um, they, you know, we're about to go off air. So doing it now is smarter than doing it later. Um, we are. By the way, I want to point out that Lisa Burnage, who I don't believe I know, says that rather than calling it retirement, it should be called doing what the fuck I want to do. <laughs> excuse the British accent. So right. I, we will excuse, excuse your bad tone and British accent, but yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Chip, Thank you were you. asking me. Well, so two, two things. Number one is I just want to make sure everybody knows about the Sages of Aging PBS theory that series that um, uh, Ken uh, actually created and is out there in the PBS universe now. Um, so take a look at that. And in fact, one of our um, workshop participants two weeks ago in our Black Modern Elder, our first Black Modern Elder workshop, Dr. Amani Woody came to that one, uh, Ken. She's the best, huh? Um, she's, she's amazing. And then secondly, I want to just say that Ken is going to be um, uh, in our new and improved version of our transitions course, which will come out at the end of January. It's a, an online course. Um, and Ken's going to have a, an amazing video uh, in, in the transitions course. It's called Navigating Midlife Transitions is the name of the, of the course. So let's go to our audience here. And we're going to start I, with- Chip, I want to say one other thing. But yes. I think one of the big things that's missing are role models. We've got theories. We've got ideas. We've got cool language. We've got people rebelling against the 20th century model of, of, of growing upness. But we look around, especially as a man, a married man, uh, my wife and I talk a lot about there's not a lot of older men in our culture on the media. You know, when I saw Rudy Giuliani with his hair dye dripping down the side of his head, I thought, wow, we've just seen the, the end of a species. You know, we need more elder role models. We need to see more 70 and 80 and 90 year olds in movies, on TV shows, uh, teaching at churches and synagogues and mosques, running courses. I think we could all benefit from some more exemplars of modern elderhood. Absolutely. Let's go to David Weaver in Vermont. Hello, Chip. Uh, great talk. Thanks for doing this. Um, 
I want to ask a question about when you brought up the the uh, I like you am fascinated by picking the right word. I made my make make and made my career in the branding industry. Inspired by MEA, I recently joined a firm full time uh, to mentor, and uh, was furious when the onboarding included the financial benefits, and I started to see sixty five as this insidious brand message that uh, really promotes this obsolete fixed mindset of retiring and retiree. Uh, so I'm curious, any examples of the rebranding of 65 to prep elderhood before it's a crisis for those becoming elders? Oh boy, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on this. I, I've been on the road for the last two weeks. So I'm a little bit wearier than usual. So I'm going to remove my filters. I um, I didn't know you had filters, but that's okay. A little bit. Uh, I was a little. little I, I feel like I'm at a stage in my life where I've just taken the gloves off. It's like enough is enough, you know. I think 65 is ridiculous, and I think it's a con. I think that older people, if and I've spoken now to two and a half million people, and about 500,000 have been over 65, and I've asked. At what age do you think you grow old, whatever that means? And usually they come back and say between 80 and 85. But maybe if we could have a better healthcare system that would match our health span to our lifespan, we could even grow old later. But then if I say so, I suppose you won't mind getting your old age survival and disability insurance, also known as Social Security, not until you're 80 or 85, I get booed off the stage. So people hold on to the 65 because there's benefits and rewards that come along with it. Uh, and that's a challenge because in America, people generally vote their age, about 30% of 30 year olds vote, about 50% of 50 year olds vote and about 70% of 70 year olds vote. So you won't see anybody running for a political office who's gonna upset older people, even though they don't make it in the marketplace, politically, they dominate. What else do I want to say to you that I think that more and more you're seeing programs, retired core senior executives, the Purpose Prize, Encore.org, which just renamed itself Cogenerate, Great Panthers is attempting to rekindle its fires. You're seeing, you know, AIM. You're seeing, you're seeing there are thousands of programs where uh, men and women in their 60s and 70s and 80s, Doctors Without Borders are doing cool things. I tried to get uh, the creation of a global elder corps a few years ago, and I was actually in New York attempting to start it up again to create a more branded, powerful, easy to access mechanism so that we could put a billion people, you know, there's a billion people over 60 right now in the world uh, doing good, purposeful things a few hours a week to be helping the younger generations and helping themselves too. So I think there's still more work to be done, but there are programs, there are projects, there are some really wonderful people. I would have to tell you, and I know I'll get blacklisted for another 15 years as I've been the last 15. I think AARP does a lot of wonderful things and it does them kind of halfway. Got it. Thank you. Um, filter off. Um, so let's go to, Colleen Drummond, who is one of my uh, co-facilitators for the uh, the Reframing Retirement Workshop in March. Colleen is a former uh, uh, partner at KPMG. Thank you. And hi, Ken. I was wondering, can you come to our workshop in March? We'd love to have you. <laughs> when? I've tried. I've March. tried. I've tried. March 19th. You know, ASA is the following week, their annual conference, and I'm returning to ASA to give the keynote. So I don't, I would love to come. I've never been to MEA and Chip's been inviting me and I will be there, but I don't think I can make that one. Oh, it would have been the perfect week. So I, I just wanted to pick your brain, given that you've been studying this space for so long, what are the best insights that you have for people as, because not everybody has a choice. Um, transitioning into retirement, what what have you? What are the biggest things that you've seen have helped people get over that hump? Other people, and and, and I, I would say that they fall into two. For me, I've witnessed they fall into kind of two major buckets. Something rough happens. You lose the person you love. You lose your testicle. You lose your breast. You lose your job. 
lost will send people and, and I would tell you that I've now spent 52 years associated with Esalen. I've been a big donor like Chip has. I ran fundraisers for decades, um, going there this weekend, actually. Um, I don't have any kind of operational or organizational role, but I sit in the baths at Esalen and, and most people are there because they've just gone through something rough in their life. And they're trying by talking about it, by hearing from other people, by feeling a little bit of love, and then by guiding into doing something new, something different, they start to feel their strength come back. The other side of it is that are people who are simply aspirational. They decide, I want to make something better of myself. I want to, uh, I want, I, I think that I, I was told when I was nine, I wasn't very good at painting, but screw that teacher in seventh grade. I'm going to learn to be an artist. I want to try to write a book. I want to gather my thoughts. I like things where older people go out and try improvisational acting and join theater groups. Uh, and I particularly like when older people decide to become mentors. And Chip is not giving himself enough credit because it's not just mentoring. If I'm just here to tell you about, you know, back in the day in the Beatles and the first time I listened to the headphones, that gets pretty boring that we who are older have to be willing to spend at least half the time saying, what can you tell me? What can you teach me? That's the process. So back to your question, Colleen, I think that that some people go towards the transition out of they got a dream they want to fulfill. They got a hope other people because they've just been kicked in the stomach. And I think that the remediation uh, openness, honesty, being near caring souls. Uh, I had the good fortune of, uh, of interviewing Houston Smith, the religious scholar, former head of religious studies at MIT when he was in his 90s for his very last interview. And it wasn't about religion. I was there to ask him about what he thought the arc of life was. But I said to him, you've lived these 90 plus years for all of us who are struggling. Uh, what advice would you give? And he said, we can all be a little kinder. So true, so true. And I'm gonna take us now to uh, Brad Jensen, who is a very kind soul, an MEA alum, who was a, a pastor and went into the financial, he was a kind pastor, went into the financial advisor world. And he has a book that just came out, um, Brad. Okay. Ken, uh, I just want to pick up on one thing that David said about reframing 65. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, of course, you spoke at a, an event called Metabesity Targeting Health Span. And I wrote this down word for word, and I read it over about 10 times. And I think this is so profound, and I'd like you to say more about it. I sit on various boards and panels with geroscientists, and I'm increasingly hearing that because of breakthroughs that are 10 or 20 years away, living to 110 or 120 or more may become commonplace. I'm gonna go silent and let you comment. First, let me tell you that I am a believer that we don't always get things right the first time. That whether it's an individual or a family or a group, you try something, you learn from it, you take a deep breath, you try another thing. What we have done is we have created a, an extraordinary version of longevity. However, it happens to be a longevity in which rich people live on average 15 years longer than poor people. So it's, it's not, it's, it's, there's no equity. And second, we have created a longevity that benefits everything from pharmaceutical companies to hospitals to long-term care providers. We have created a circumstance where we have our lifespan, which in the United States has dropped down to 77, and there are 37 countries in the world that live longer than we do, even though we spend more on healthcare than every country in the world. But our health span is 12 years before that. It, sh it, it starts to fall apart. So we have somehow created, and I'd say it's been a mistake, not an evil mistake, it's just like, wow, 
we have not created a healthy longevity. And I used to say healthy aging. I actually made up that phrase in 1990 and took a lot of crap from the academic field because they thought there could be no healthy aging. Aging is all about sickness. And so that's been reframed. And I, I stayed hard on that one. But I'm using the word healthy longevity now. And I don't mean living to 9,000 or something. I mean, living out our 100 or so years <laughs> with high levels of health and vitality and then having a very compressed period of decline. Uh, that is not what we have set up our medical system, our pharmaceutical system, our educational system, our religious system to bring about. And health is driven by our genetics, but just as much, if not more, by our lifestyle, by our contribution, by our purpose, by our mindset. And uh, I, I'll add one last piece to this answer that there are breakthroughs, not perhaps in our lifetime, Brad, but maybe, uh, you know, I'm 72 now, not in the next five or 10 years, but certainly in the next 20, as biotechnology becomes increasingly infotechnology, it becomes subject to Moore's law, which means it doubles in intelligence about every 18 months at half the cost. And so I can envision five or 10 years from now breakthroughs so that we can put an end to cancer, we can put an end to diabetes, put an end to vascular disease, and hopefully put an end to Alzheimer's, which I think is the most dastardly of all of them. And I can envision the possibility of being able to, through CRISPR, uh, slightly manipulate our genetic package so that living to 120 will become commonplace for our children and their children. Whether they have purpose and whether the world is decent and fair and not a junkyard is largely up to us who are older that have the power so that we create a better future for those who will be living longer and longer. Terrific. Please write something about that for the New York Times or some other major effort. That's a terrific piece. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Let's go to George. George, it's really late in London. Are you in London right now? Uh oh, I lost him. Let me find him. Hold on a second. Okay, we'll find him. Where'd you uh, go, George? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, I am. Okay. Are you are you in London right now? I am in London. Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you for calling in so late in the evening. Um, I couldn't miss this one. It's been uh, riveting. Thank you, thank you, Chip, and thank you, Ken. Uh, always George. good to hear you. Always good to hear you. And thank you for your testimonial for my book. R truly appreciate that. I read um, your book on purpose. I read your book on what retirees want. And obviously, massive amounts of uh, information and knowledge and wisdom. One of the things that captured my imagination was when you said in, in what retirees want, you mentioned that we can look forward to uh, mass elder poverty. And to put it into context, you were saying that uh, an average retire, and you were quoting the Social Security Administration numbers, that to have a half decent retirement, you need about a million dollars. Um, Charles Schwab have since come up that you need $2 million. But what you said was that the average pre-retiree in the United States had savings of $135,000 or thereabouts. So, um, and it's on the back of that, that you said, we can expect mass elder poverty. Is your view still that? Do you see mass elder poverty down the road because people aren't changing the way they live, the way they work, the way they think? Oops. <laughs> I, um... History, sociology, demography, psychology have their way of dancing together. So our parents' generation, having been heavily influenced by the Depression, were savers. And they, my grandmother always used to say, you better save for a rainy day. Uh, boomers grew up in a time of great prosperity. Groomers in Great Britain, in China, in America, all over the world. And we somehow never worried about a rainy day. And then credit cards came along in the 1970s and we started spending more than we actually earned. And then we flipped guaranteed benefits to defined contribution in some of the countries of the world like the United States, which meant that you're responsible for your own financing your future. And we're not terribly good at that. And so I worry that many members of the current nearly 
elder generation have simply not saved enough, nor had the discipline to be able to provide for themselves if they live a 20 or 30 year retirement. However, I will say to you on the hopeful note um, that there are workarounds. There was a really wild science fiction show in the 1980s called Golden Girls, where what people did was they had roommates. Having a roommate will help you live comfortably in later years. Working three more extra years, even half time, will shore you up. Going back to work for a little while, even if it's at a modest income, or frankly, there's part of the problem is in a youthful world, we use income as a measure, but in a long lived world, income is not a good measure because two thirds of people over 65 in America, I'm not sure the Great Britain numbers right now, own their own homes, three quarters of which are paid off. So to be a young person and have to pay $3,000 a month to live in a home that if you're an older person, it's paid off, ways to liquidate or to monetize a home like Airbnb or in Great Britain with uh, equity release programs. So there are going to be workarounds because we're not gonna see a billion people miserable. What we're gonna see are people giving up certain things having trade-offs, making some course corrections, and finding a way to live well in their later years. Thank, Thank you, Ken. You, so uh, to Michael and to Lori, who had their hands up and we don't have time, I've sent you private messages with my email address. So you can send me the email and um, either Ken or I will try to answer them. I just want, because we're over our time, I want to make sure that uh, we are able to wrap here and just give a proper thank you to Ken. Ken, go ahead. You have Yeah, there were several questions. I want to make sure I'm clear about it. So I took the idea of a personal memoir, and during COVID, I identified the 12 elder leading figures in the fields of aging and longevity, and I entered them. We called it the Sages of Aging. And then we distilled it down to a one-hour special, and it's now airing all over America Sages of Aging on PBS. And I would say that every single professional field, whether it's dentistry or home cleaning or hospitality, ought to gather the wisdom of its elders and institutionalize it for future generations. Mm. Love that. So many good ideas. Thank you for everybody showing up. Carrie, thank you. I'll let you do the final wrap. Thank sure. you, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful time. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, Chip. I hope you see by the chat. That was an amazing conversation. All of you who registered for the call will get a follow-up email with the recording if you want to see this again, and we'll post it on our Modern Elder Academy YouTube page. Woo! Thank you guys so much. We have another fireside chat with Chip and Soren Gornhammer from Wisdom 2.0 next Wednesday. Um, so we hope to see you there. You'll get a link for that also in your email. So thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Ken. Be well. Thank you.